My priorities are the same as they ever were, Yolanda. My work. Mankind. Not as it currently stands, of course. But the soul of it. Humanity as it should be. As it must be. Perfected by my hand. Driven by my will. This new mankind shall flourish and spread through the new night, carrying the light of my wisdom to every corner of the cosmos, a light you turned away from, a light you abandoned. Greetings friends and welcome to the Imperium's Most Wanted. I'm Lorcan, and this is only war. This is chapter 2 of the story of Fabius Bile. As we've seen as the Horus heresy unfolded, Fabius was instrumental in the surgical alteration of his fellow Astartes, rewiring their sensory nervous systems and altering brain chemistries that spurred their drive to experience the most debased of excesses. The resultant slide into unfettered sensation-seeking saw his legion turn away from the light of the Emperor, corrupted from within by Fulgrim's own descent into the darkness, and the ministrations performed on Bile's slab. Each discovery a small step in his great work, to unravel the tapestry of genetic information, to understand the forbidden sciences of the Emperor himself, and weave it anew in his own vision. Yet while Bile himself never underwent the augmentative surgeries he so thoroughly inflicted on his so-called brothers, the focus of his self-surgeries was on preserving himself from the blight that riddled his body, whether through chemical means or through the perfection of his cloning techniques. Not out of fear of death, but out of fear his great work would go unfinished. Chapter 2 will take us from the Siege of Terror through to the Shattering of Luganath. The events of the Horus Heresy accumulated in the Siege of the Emperor's Palace. The Emperor's children, along with the other traitor legions under the sway of the War Master, invaded Terror with Horus and were originally thought to have played little direct part in the fighting around the palaces. It was believed they quickly lost all vestige of discipline and descended upon the civilian population of Terra in an orgy of depraved violence. As his fellow Astartes lost themselves in sensuality, Bile would follow his own dark path. Free from the constraints of ethics, remorse, or pity, he left Holy Terra shortly before Horus's defeat at the hands of the Emperor, accompanied by a handful of his most gifted acolytes. During the initial stages of the ground assault during the Siege of Terror, the Emperor's children attacked the Lion's Gate spaceport and took hundreds of Imperial Army captives, but Fulgrim was a petulant participant, and while technically deployed, Perturabo knew they could not be relied upon. Perturabo, who was leading the siege, and Abaddon identified the increasingly bored patrician as their immediate problem. They needed a glorious task to flatter Fulgrim, focus the attention of his legion, and channel them to genuine effect. Eidolon would present this plan to Fulgrim, and he is enamoured enough with the chance to break the deadlock and seize victory, that he offers to lead his entire legion in person for the assault on the Saturnine Wall. While massive donjon siege engines used their launch units to fire drop pods onto the walls near the Oanus gun tower, the sound of sonic booms would roll across the defenders' lines as pockets of darkness opened along the fighting platform, and the champion elite of the third, warriors too beautiful and ornamented to behold, stepped forward with grace. Clad in full artificial armour, etched in gold, Fulgrim emerged from one of these warp fissures, his hair unbound and trailing like a glorious pennant of shining white satin. He would be challenged first by the Templar Sigismund, and then, just as Fulgrim grew tired of playing with the Imperial Fist, 
and seemed ready to end his resistance by Dawn himself. The duel with Dawn would go in the favour of the Praetorian, forcing Fulgrim to give some indication of the extent of his new powers to heal the wounds he had suffered at Dawn's hands before shifting into his serpentine, demonic form. Luckily for Dawn and the defenders, Fulgrim would claim to be sick of the siege and withdrew, leaving his elite warriors, including Eidolon, to face the might of Dawn and Sigismund. The Emperor's children were driven from the wall, and perhaps in answer to some petulant summons from their fleeing lord, they withdrew, abandoning their traitorous allies. They tore their way across terror in the hunt for slaves, and the satisfaction of butchering the undefended population. When the Third Legion travelled into the Eye's tides in their retreat from the Loyalists, their holds were already full of man-flesh, and that foresight served them well in the years of the Legion Wars that followed. It is not clear exactly when Fabius made the decision to leave the Siege of Terror. He himself claims in those final days to have had an epiphany, seeing the futility of what the traitors were trying to accomplish, and having no wish to throw his life away and waste the potential of his work. By choosing his own destiny, he denied his Primarch the benefit of his knowledge and skills during their retreat, and Fulgrim has never forgiven this decision. Yet for all his twisted genius, Bile could not hold back the furious crusade of loyalists that launched outward from ravaged terror. Severely depleted as they were following the events on Istvan V, the Salamanders could take little part in these actions, however there was one that Vulcan himself vowed to undertake. Upon terror, the scale of destruction had initially hidden one of the greatest atrocities of the entire heresy. While the Emperor's children appeared to only sporadically engage in the Siege of Terror itself, when they withdrew, they wrought a terrible toll on the Terran population. Administratum scribes, prefects, and all manner of other civilians were captured as they fled the war zone. It is said that more than a million prisoners were rendered down under Bile's supervision, and distilled into an array of stimulants and intoxicants for the Emperor's children to ingest. As orchestrator of these and many other atrocities, Vulcan vowed his depleted salamanders would see Fabius brought to justice. Bile's warband cut through the war-torn Imperium like an ingested shard of glass, spreading genetic corruption amongst the human populations on every step of their journey. Wherever he made planetfall, the primogenitor offered his assistance, in exchange for prisoners, genetic samples, an ancient technical Libra. Many ambitious planetary overlords came to rue the day they joined their fates with the Clone Lord. His atrocities and acts of mass genocide often repelled even those who had ordered them in the first place. Nonetheless, few could deny the assistance Bile offered was potent. His serums could transform mediocre defense troopers into ravening super soldiers, and his mastery of the cloning process saw him able to mobilize thousands of perfect warriors within months. It pained Vulcan greatly, as he was forced to ignore many planetary distress calls in his single-minded pursuit of bile. The salamanders followed rumours of rampaging genetic abnormalities, and agricultural shipments of hormonal stimulants being hijacked. Tracing him through his covert network of devotees and the contacts for his illicit supplies to the way station of Deltos IV Corporus in the Gelden sector. The transport hub had fallen to the Dark Mechanicum during the heresy, and although Fabius eluded them, the station's computer gave them his next destination, the world of Arden Nine. On Arden 9, Bile was supporting the excesses of the planet's rebellious planetary governor, a Lord Tyrell. The governor's palace lay at the centre of a huge industrial plaza, which Fabius used as a base of operations while he conducted various experiments on the terrified population. 
Tyrell was supplied with newly enhanced recruits, subjected to perverted surgical alterations, and pumped full of chemical stimulants and gene-altering drugs, in exchange for unquestioned access to harvested genetic material. The Adeptus Astartes launched themselves down upon the corrupted world, with Vulcan himself at the head. Biles, flesh refineries, and cloning vats all burned in a single night, as the righteous fury of the Salamander's chapter incinerated all evidence of the primogenitor's precious experiments. They were surprised by the combat effectiveness of the mutated abominations, and Bile himself proved a highly dangerous combatant, gifting a dozen Astartes with agonizing and inventive deaths. Yet he was forced to flee for his life in the face of the fury of Vulcan himself, releasing all his half-finished creations and abandoning his retinue to make his escape aboard a hidden ship. The Salamanders were immediately in pursuit, crippling Bile's ship, but the disruption of the warp drives meant it disappeared into a vortex of sickly lights, leaving no trace for the avenging Salamanders to follow. Whether by accident or design, Bile's vessel was slowly drawn into the Eye of Terror. He drifted there for an age, constantly experimenting on those few acolytes who he had left until his ship was drawn into the gravity well of a demon world. Once the planet had been a jewel of the Eldar civilization, before their own debaucheries saw that civilization torn apart. Now it was a shriveled ruin, a crone world of seething madness that echoed to the screams of souls long dead. This was the crone world of Urum, and it would remain Fabius's main base of operations for the millennia to come. With Fulgrim withdrawing more from his legion as he indulged in the great game, and other prominent commanders such as Marius and Eidolon either missing or killed, it was Fabius who rose to prominence in leading one of the largest warbands made from the remnants of the Third Legion. But he kept his work on Urum separate from his coordination and cooperation with the other warbands. In the time that followed, the Traitor Legions fought a great many battles amongst each other, mostly over the worlds in the newly settled Eye that could provide resources and slaves to meet their many needs the traitor legions began to fracture as cohesive forces, devolving into scores of rampaging warbands. Despite leaving terror with vast numbers of enslaved citizens, and gaining even more in flesh tithes and raids on other imperial worlds during their retreat to the Eye, the insatiable lusts and excessive desires of the Third Legion, alongside Fabius's own needs, meant their supply of slaves soon became exhausted. As a result, they began to assault the other traitorous legions within the Eye of Terror, with the primary goal of plundering their slave stocks for use in their own perverse pleasures. Despite heavy losses in conflicts like the Battle of Scalathrax against the World Eaters, where Khan earned the moniker the Betrayer, the Emperor's children still maintained reasonably significant numbers, and some form of cohesion, with Fabius's skills and resources giving him a prominent presence in the Third Legion, and the ability to rally them to his own ends. Located on the demon world of Harmony, the Canticle City served as a haven to many Third Legion warbands and their allies. From here, Fabius conceived a scheme to capture the body of the Warmaster from the Sons of Horus stronghold, known as Luper Kalios or the Monument, on the world of Malium. The Emperor's children, bolstered by Slaneshi demonic allies and leading vessels from every other traitor legion, descended on the mausoleum of the 16th Legion, leaving it an ashen ruin, and capturing the body of Horus. On finally reaching Horus's status tomb, we get some insight into Fabius's mindset on the best course for the legions, as he talks to Haruk, a Sons of Horus apothecary. What the gods have ruined, I shall repair. Gods, the sheer hubris of that term. 
There are no gods. That is what we were fighting for, Haruk. Your gene father understood that, as did mine, I think. We were liberators, freeing the galaxy from superstition and madness. Only Horus had to go and welcome it back in, didn't he? Making ill-considered pacts with multi-dimensional intelligences that feed on the gullible and the fearful alike. And now look at us, Haruk. Look at what we have become. Barbarians, beasts and fools. Well, someone has to get us going in the right direction again. Physician, heal thyself. And everyone else while you're at it. The responsibility falls to me as the only sane man left in this benighted universe. I shall lift my head high and guide my fellows out from the grim darkness. It's the idealist in me, I think. Plundering the remains of Horace Lupercal from where they lay in state was quickly identified as more than a simple act of desecration. And with the involvement of Bile, the thoughts of those sons of Horus fleeing the Battle of Lupercalios soon turned to the genetic bounty he could reap from the corpse. Despite the many atrocities committed by the nine traitor legions during the heresy and its aftermath, cloning Astartes was still seen by most as a sin too far, even in the lawless expanse of eye space, the results too unstable and erratic. While those outside a select few in the third believed cloning a Primarch to be well beyond Fabius's capability, they also realised that Horus Reborn would bring a swift end to the Legion Wars, and more than that, he would be the only mortal Primarch still able to invade the Imperium. These events, and the possible ramifications, led to a small group of Legion warriors, the Thousand Sun Sorcerer Secunder Cain amongst them, forming an alliance in order to seek out Abaddon, and the vessel he had commanded since Horus fell, the Warmaster's flagship, the Vengeful Spirit. Abaddon had taken the Vengeful Spirit past what was known as the Fire Tides of the Radiant Worlds, into the unscannable depths of the Elishinian Vale, and powered the ship down beneath the surface of a broken world. The allied traitors came ready to take the ship by force if necessary, however Abaddon did not need convincing of the peril posed by Fabius's scheme. Quite the opposite, he revealed his plans for the birth of a new legion. He asked for them all to align their goals and coordinate their efforts, and agreed that if he was to return to the battles raging throughout the Eye, it would be for a war that truly meant something. While refusing to underestimate the danger posed by Horus Reborn, at this stage they believed it was a distant threat, thinking that the Emperor's children had decades of failed experimentation ahead of them. Abaddon and his new allies were unaware of the great strides Fabius had made in cloning Primarchs, particularly when provided with genetic samples directly, as he had been with Ferris Manus. Despite this, Abaddon devised a plan to strike at the Canticle City, and prevent the Emperor's children winning the Legion Wars. All other objectives were secondary to taking out Bile's flesh-crafting facilities. The Canticle City was far from a soft target, with extensive fortifications and firepower to repel assaults from orbit. But while fighting back an invasion was one thing, resisting a cataclysm was another. The shrieking hymns broadcast from Vox Towers were drowned out by the futile fire of defence batteries lighting up the darkening sky, and an ominous shadow burned as it fell first due to its entry into the atmosphere, and then from the munitions of the Canticle City. 
The Thaloc was almost two kilometers and eight megatons of ancient ironclad anger. Once it had sailed the stars in the name of the 15th Legion, the Thousand Sun Sorcerer Secunda Kane had dragged its corpse across the Eye of Terror and hurled it right into the heart of the Third Legion's fortress. Less than a minute passed from the moment it entered Harmony's atmosphere to the second it struck the ground, long enough to let the population see death falling towards them, not long enough to do anything about it. The Canticle City ceased to exist. A conflagration had torn out in all directions from the Talox impact site. Everything, everywhere, was reduced to dust, ashes, and flame. An entire fortress city, slain by a single warship, hurled from orbit, bearing thousands of tons of volatile chemicals and tactical warheads. Worse was to come, as the metaphysical trauma caused by the near annihilation of the planet's population spawned thousands of demons in their last moments of helpless terror and searing pain. In orbit, with the Anamnesis piloting, the vengeful spirit was merciless in destroying the fleeing vessels of the Emperor's children until they spotted their quarry. The Pol Critudinus, a lunar-class cruiser also known as the Flesh Market, under the control of the Primogenitor himself. The initial boarding party would first encounter a sentinel organism, part neverborn, part lab-forged monstrosity, showing how, despite his loathing of the belief in the gods, the Chief Apothecary had no qualms combining demonic material into his fleshy creations. In the chaos of the evacuation, Fabius had not prepared for a boarding action, but still they had to butcher their way through bone-crafted human thralls and monstrous neverborn that reeked of alchemical meddling, rotting while alive, stinking of natural and unnatural excretions alike. Stepping through a conduit opened by the boarding party in his Terminator war plate, sallow skin crisscrossed with spidery black veins. Abaddon cast around his golden gaze. In one hand, he carried his battered power sword. In the other, he was wearing the Talon of Horus. His forces slaughtered everything alive on that ship between where they came aboard and where they found the Primogenitor. When they reached the Apothecarian, they were brought to a halt. This was not the laboratory of one who was struggling to manipulate one of the most ancient and flawed of sciences. This was the sanctum of a madman, who had already succeeded. Fabius had already mastered that forbidden lore and delved even further. They were not there to purge this place before an abomination could be done. They were far too late for that already. Great sustaining tanks that contained half-formed perversions of life were tended by servitors and mutated thralls that drifted between the machinery, tending to the feculent nursery. The Emperor's genetic project, rebuilt and reimagined through the Clone Lord's twisted genius, Row upon row of filthy tanks contained mutated children and deformed adolescents, each with a feature or two that could identify their Primarch genetic origin. A clone of Lorgar melded to a smear of biological matter coating one wall of its tank, and in another floated an infant Fulgrim with white hair and wide knowing eyes that spat toxins as they approached. The Chief Apothecary approached unarmed, wearing the white and purple of the Emperor's children, nearly lost beneath what looked like years of encrusted filth. With thinning white hair that hung lank from his scalp down to his shoulders, he looked utterly ravaged by time. Fabius would lament the damage to his work and the centuries of study it represented, but Abaddon would not be swayed. 
Fabius had the dignity not to protest as Abaddon ordered his forces to open fire, and across the laboratory glass shattered and flesh burnt. Things that should never have been born wailed as they died, until all that was left was the stench of putrescent blood hanging in the air. But from a far antechamber, Fabius summoned his greatest success to date. Not a child cloned from scraps of tissue and drops of blood. Not some half-formed abomination trapped inside a containment tank. It was Horus Lubrical, as he was before he embraced the Pantheon's touch. Clad in his black warplate, replete with white wolf fur cloak, he charged into their ranks, slaughtering them with World Breaker. The carnage continued until Abaddon confronted the clone of his gene sire and rejected his existence. The clone lashed out, but Abaddon not only parried the mace, he caught it, he held it, he gripped it in the talon stained with the blood of a god and his angel, and closed his fist. Worldbreaker broke, and Abaddon drove the Talon's claws deep into Horus's chest. Just as his greatest creation fell, they realized Fabius had already made his escape. The Third Legion had ceased to exist as a single entity the moment Ezekiel Abaddon had decided to punish Bile for trying to repair the mistakes of the past. These events in the mid-31st millennium effectively ended the slave wars in the Eye of Terror, and saw the Black Legion truly rise from the ashes of the Sons of Horus, under Abaddon's command. Although some claim he could have stayed and rallied the remnants of the Third Legion, the reality was they bore him no love, and many blamed him for their plight. Fulgrim himself had set a bounty on his former apothecary's head, and for years after the fall of Canticle City, his foes hounded him. Not just rivals and renegades, but Xenos and worse. His chosen course had set him at odds with a thousand factions, and all of them wanted him either bound to their will, or dead. Bile soon discovered that the shattered traitor legions making their home in the Eye of Terror in the 32nd millennium had particular need of his skills. His augmented warriors, clones, and combat stimulants were put to good use on a hundred battlefields. Yet it was the skills that Fabius had learned as an Astartes apothecary that were most precious to the traitor legions. Most of all, they needed Bile's ability to extract precious progenoid glands from the fallen in order to create new Chaos Space Marines. Without these skills, the long war would falter, and the fires that Horus lit would be extinguished. With so much influence at his behest, Fabius Bile negotiated a delicate bargain with the traitor legions, selling his secrets to each of them, but refusing to aid one any more than any other. In this way, the primogenitor ensured his position at the heart of a genetic web that spanned across the Eye of Terror and beyond. With the defeat at Canticle City, and Abaddon's return, we see a definite shift in Fabius. He does not abandon his vision for a new future for mankind, but his dream of recreating the Primarchs to do it was dead. Exploring the ruins on Harmony many years later, Fabius would say, I could have saved us, if only they'd listened. Our fathers abandoned us, but I could have brought them back, made them whole, sane, healthy. We could have stepped back from the brink, shed ourselves of the weight of our sins. The Great Crusade could have begun again, as if it had never been interrupted. Fabius had already built up a network of connections throughout the worlds of I space and beyond, and using his few remaining flesh vats, he provided more biological creations for various tyrants, including Queen Spore of the Dark Mechanicum, who would provide him with the means to rebuild and repair his ancient Medicae equipment from her forge world of Quir. 
Fabius had always attracted followers, and despite his often single-minded focus on his work, he continued to do so particularly amongst the remaining apothecaries of the traitor legions. Many years previously, Fabius had began to gather these talented individuals, in a flexible collective that he came to call the Consortium, on the crone world of Urum he had taken for his own. Urum existed in a state of half-life within the eye. Its main cityscape was a jungle of living bone, and wildly overgrown hummocks of rough, psychoplastic flesh. Wraithbone walls adorned with twisted faces like fungal growths loomed over the new residents. At the centre of the main city lay the palace Fabius had taken for his own and converted to meet the needs of himself and his consortium of acolytes. Its delicate tiers accommodating a proliferation of power sources and radiation vents, necessary for their nefarious studies, and gun emplacements to deter any unwelcome visitors approaching from orbit. Around the outer areas of the palace, an entire civilization of twisted mutants developed. To these failed experiments and their descendants, he was the Pater Mutatis, the benefactor, and venerated. To Fabius, they were a meat shield. The repurposed palace would be renamed as the Grand Apothecarian, and his consortium, united by a shared desire to learn more of the arts of flesh and bone, of gland and organ, from the acknowledged master gathered there. Some would remain there for centuries attempting to glean all he knew, some would come to learn a specific skill, some learned nothing and became a lesson themselves. The palace itself was a labyrinth of concentric rings, home to various apothecaria and vivisectora established by the members of the consortium, a bedlam of the grotesque filled with the sights, smells and sounds of abomination, a cult of genius, where sanctuary was given to those who sought to indulge in their own depravity, abetted by one whose utter corruption far outstripped their own. The focus of the Clone Lord's work had shifted since the defeat of the Clone of Horus. Fabius still sought to improve upon the flawed designs of those who had come before, but now he aimed to seed the stars with a new man, one adapted to the grim darkness they faced. A former Emperor's Children apothecary and prior member of the consortium named Olanda Ko returned to Urum to deliver a tempting proposition. When Olanda was escorted closer to the heart of the palace, he found it guarded by heavily muscled men and women in the guard of planetary militia, each tattooed with facial identification codes. These are Fabius's gland hounds, designed to be part of his vision for a new humanity. Stronger, faster, and more aggressive than regular humans, these were the first generation born of a partial gene seed implantation, refined over time as the chief apothecary devised his own more stable but lesser form of the gene seed. The gland hounds were built to hunt Astartes for their gene seed, a particularly valuable skill to many of the remaining warbands of the traitor legions. While not generally a match for their prey one-on-one, -on -one, they hunted in packs. They are led by Fabius's favourite, Ignori, a fearsome warrior with a perfect square symmetrical face, who sports the teeth of numerous Astartes hanging round her neck. Orlando would be admitted into the inner sanctum, the largest chamber of the palace, lined with sample jars containing oculobes, Calespian nodes, and Belcher's glands, most procured from the bodies of Astartes that hung from the ceiling on crude hooks. When Orlando is finally reunited with his former master, the chief apothecary is performing another extensive self-examination. The articulated limbs of the chirurgeon, bent over Bile's narrow body, flaps of his flesh were pinned back to reveal the black carapace buried within the subcutaneous tissue. The chirurgeon had developed something akin to semi-sentinence under the influence of the eye, and alongside his corrupted power armour, Fabius would come to think of himself almost as a symbiont with his own equipment. 
when he allowed himself a rare moment of slumber. Bile dreamed that the harness detached itself from him and scurried around his apothecarian, conducting its own investigations and improving its own functionality. Bile was believed to be the last living sufferer of the blight that nearly wiped out the third, and the reason for this being that he had already successfully cloned himself on a number of occasions by this point. His prognosis even before the Siege of Terror was that he would succumb to organ failure in mere years. Despite his towering intellect, and having studied his ongoing deterioration since before Fulgrim led the Legion to the Dark, he still seemed no closer to purging his affliction. Orlando's proposition was for Fabius to aid in an attack on an elder craft world called Luganath. Fabius inquires who is making the offer, to be informed it is a being now going by the title The Radiant King. A former legionary Fabius once knew as Kasparos Telma, who was part of the select few that participated in the compliance of Byzance, along with Fabius, in the first campaign the Third Legion undertook, solely under Fulgrim. Oleander was now serving as the Radiant's chief apothecary, and as one of his joy-bound, his Lord Commanders. The Radiant seeks apotheosis, and a sacrifice worthy to be offered up to Slaanesh, and the Prince of Pleasure values the souls of the Eldar above all others. Fabius held fast to his own particular faith, a twisted version of the Imperial truth despite the things he'd seen. In him, the fires of the Great Crusade still flickered, however weakly. To Bile, the belief in gods was still for the weak-minded, attributing motive and personality to a random confluence of phenomena. With his examination complete and the incision sutured, Bile would start to assemble his full war gear, and alongside the Zyklos Needler he has used since the drop site massacre, he would also be handed a skull-topped scepter that he named Torment. It is unclear when in the previous centuries Fabius came into possession of the ancient hell-forged artifact. It had once belonged to a demon prince, Shalaklak, Bile had taken it from the dissolving claw of the so-called Marquis of Mutilation himself, and had reforged it into a less ostentatious tool, more suited to his own purposes. The scepter was an amplifier, the slightest touch eliciting a raging torrent of agony, but it also filled him with a strength long stripped by the cancerous blight, another twisted symbiosis between Bile and his war gear. Orlander admits that while the Radiant King's fleet is able to find the craft world, they are detected both mechanically and psychically long before they are able to engage their quarry, the Eldar using the webway to evade their pursuers. In Bile's mind, possibilities and solutions were conceived, analysed and discarded in microseconds. His enemies were many and varied these days, and they wore all colours, not just black or purple. Past mistakes and missteps dogged his path, and the possibility of this being a trap could not be immediately discounted. He was still widely accepted as a master of his craft. The services he provided in keeping the traitor legions from withering into irrelevance kept him safe for the moment, but he suspected that soon it wouldn't be enough. Fabius did not fear death, so much as he was frustrated by it. He had a duty to his own legacy, a responsibility to bring about the next steps in humanity's long journey towards its proper place in the universe, a place ordained by him. The galaxy would burn, and from its ashes would rise a new galaxy, and a new people, made strong by his ministrations. But for that, he needed time, more time than he had. Fabius elected to have Orlando present his proposition to the consortium as a whole, saying that if some amongst them found merit in the proposal, then he would take the course of action that he deemed most suitable. The gathered apothecaries heard Alanda's proposal, and despite hostility from many of their number, he gathered enough support for Fabius to agree to join the Radiant King in his pursuit of the Eldar. Their first task was to travel to the world of Sublime, to find a suitable guide. 
Sublime existed trapped on the edge of the Eye of Terror, where the raw stuff of unreality gave way to the hard fact of real space, caught between moments, on the cusp of oblivion. A frozen fractal of diverging rock and superheated gases expanding away from a boiling core with infinitesimal slowness. The world was eternally dying, trapped in its final instant. Travelling aboard Bile's personal vessel, the Vestalius, an ancient Gladius-class frigate, their destination was Black Golan, the largest Archeo market in this region of the Eye. In order to bypass the orbital defences entirely, Bile ordered the Vestalius to travel a path known as the Carrion Road, the route the Neverborn take into the inner death of Sublime. The raw wound in reality, opened by the warp storm which doomed Sublime many millennia ago. The Carrion Road was not some mere cosmological phenomenon. It was a torrent of thoughts and emotions, waves of anguish and despair, rolling along on a tide of hatred. They would take this path to avoid detection, but to do so, the Vestalius had to drop its Geller field and plunge headfirst into hell. Demonic entities started to manifest all over the ship, and the mortal crew and traitor Astartes alike began to suffer their infernal whispers. Most were easily dealt with, until through Orlanda, the Keeper of Secrets known as Kanathara was able to materialise. With the others fighting off the lesser Neverborn, Fabius confronted the greater demon of Sonesh. Taunting Kanathara by refusing to accept it as anything more than a figment of their imaginations, Fabius landed repeated strikes with torment before the demon revealed that it had a message. As is typical of its kind, the message was vague, a greeting and a warning from what Cathanda called a dear friend, Fulgrim himself. The message delivered, Fabius drew his needler and put a needle straight into the demon's eye, but it carried no ordinary toxin. The null solution tore the entity apart from the inside. Kanathara tore itself apart, ripping chunks from its dissolving flesh as it tried to dig out the poison. It stumbled on melting hooves and wailed, until at last its skull collapsed in on itself. With Kanathada defeated, the Vestalia speared out of the Carrion Road and into the interior of Sublime. In the markets of Black Golan, Orlanda and the world bearer Shakada tracked down their prey, the Corsairs of the Sunblitz Brotherhood. With the aid of Ignori and her gland hounds, they were able to capture one of the Corsairs and the frigate the Butcher Bird was dispatched to retrieve them and their prize. The Corsairs regrouped and encircled the would-be kidnappers, but they withdrew at the arrival of a troop of Harlequins that wounded Fabius and forced him to split his forces as they beat a hurried retreat. A conversation between Orlando and the Shadow Seer of the Harlequin troop revealed that they were well aware of the Radiance King's plans, and that their own motivation was for Fabius, whom they claim will act in the role of the King of Feathers, and whose destiny is to shed his rags and take his throne. Having split his forces to cover his escape, the wounded Fabius was approaching the second rendezvous point when his Glandhound guards were slaughtered and the troop master appears to taunt Fabius. The arrival of Orlanda coincided with the withdrawal of the Harlequins, and while their prisoner had been returned to the Butcher Bird, the battles with the Corsairs and Harlequins had not gone unnoticed. Fabius was confronted next by Mordrak, the Castellan of Castle Sublime, and the reason they had taken the Carrion Road rather than seeking conventional entry into the trading hub. The situation looked dire until the Butcher Bird arched overhead and brought all of its malevolent firepower to bear, allowing them to escape back to the Vestalius. On board, Fabius turned his attention to extracting the information he required from their Eldar captive, and proceeded to carefully pluck out the Eldar's eye before implanting a creature of his own creation, a mind worm. Equal parts grown and built with a morphology similar to a flattened centipede, the mind worm crawled forward, swelling, whirling, twisting until it filled the socket. The mind worm would copy the brain patterns of its host and store them in its core, 
thoughts, memories, dreams would all be downloaded into the apparatus for easy transfer to a data spike. The route to Luganeth would be found and uploaded to the fleet's cogitators, and the Eldar would survive for further testing. Taking Orlando and the Iron Warrior Apothecary Zemiskis with him on the Butcher Bird, they approached the flagship of the Radiant King's fleet, the Quas Hazat, named after a legendary beast of Chemos. As they were escorted to an audience with the Radiant King, Orlando makes a confession. While the goal was as he had stated, it was not on the Radiant King's order he has sought out his former master. They are granted an audience with the former Kasparos Telmar, and find him lounging on a wide throne made from the flesh and bone of still living sibling slaves. The Radiant was beautiful, his features almost androgynous. He wore what had once been a suit of crusade pattern power armor, chestplate decorated with a grotesque mural depicting Fulgrim's moment of apotheosis. One of his shoulder plates fused and twisted into the shape of a leering feminine face. Bile offered his help in capturing Luganath, presenting Kasparoth with a data spike. But despite this, Orlando was made to fight off the other members of the Joybound in retribution for leaving without permission, and Fabius is forced to interject, wielding torment with fearsome skill. Having forced the Joybound back, Fabius asked if Honor was satisfied, and the Radiant agrees. The Clone Lord reveals what he wants for his part of the endeavor. The crystalline forms of the Xenos Psychers contained in one of the Craft World's chambers. While waiting for the decision of the Radius King, Fabius mulls over recent events, pondering if the affair on Sublime was all part of some esoteric scheme on the part of the Harlequins. He would discover that paranoia to be justified. Fabius begins the preparations to allow the Radiant's fleet to get within striking distance of the Eldar craft world. His plan was to use the powerful Psyker captured after an attack on one of the black ships of the Imperium. Bile believed that by taking samples of brain matter from the Psyker, his abilities could be grafted onto another and amplified, creating a psychic fog that might prevent the fleet from detection. Combined with grafts taken from their Eldar prisoner, Bile was certain he could create the necessary sensory organs to lead them both to their prey and hide them from its gaze. He confides in the World Eater Arian, the most loyal member of his consortium, what he truly desires from the crystalline psychers of the craft world. Not just the secrets of their longevity, but their continuality of thought and memory across eons. For Fabius, this would finally be a way to achieve freedom from his tumor-riddled body. Freedom from arduous and dangerous surgical procedures. A way the mind would be capable of passing from one body to the next instantaneously. He needs both uncorrupted wraith bone and the knowledge of the mechanism of transference, and he intends to extract this from the crystalline Xenos. After contemplating their proposal, the Radiant King summoned Fabius back to the Quas Hazat. He asks how Bile will help take Luganath, and Fabius reveals his solution. Contained in a heavy nutrient tank floating suspended in a liquid was an intricate web of neural matter spliced from the brains of over a hundred psychers culled from his collection. He reveals it will work by implementation, layered over the existing neural tissue of living psychers, and then hardwired into the Quas Hazat's central cognitor core. The effect would be akin to a Geller field, ensuring that while the Eldar might see them, they would not perceive them. To complete his plan, Fabius needs a living body to act as a central node, an augmented one capable of enduring stresses beyond the norm even for an Astartes. He believes a noise marine's altered physiology could withstand the pressures that this neural web will create. Fabius and the members of his consortium make the journey across the massive vessel, to the area the cacophony have claimed for their own, the House of Noise. On entering the House of Noise, they found the deck had been all but gutted and turned into a conclave expanse, pierced through by gantries. The walls had been modified to reflect and enhance the sounds being emitted within, turning the space into an enormous resonator. 
There were hundreds of cacophony standing or sprawled on the wide gantries that crisscrossed the cavernous space, singing, playing and screaming, twisting the atmosphere into new and unusual shapes with the strength of their sound. He'd had no direct hand in the modifications made to most of them, but he recognised elements of his early work easily enough. All noise marines were, in some sense, descended from those first crude surgeries he'd performed at Fulgrim's behest. Approaching a noise marine he recognises a former sergeant called Alain, who is one of the few to have been modified by Fabius's hand. The chief apothecary promises he will allow him to join his voice to the warp itself, and his brothers will sing amid the ruins of a dying race if he will allow Fabius to apply his tender ministrations once again. Elion agrees, and is taken to the core chamber, where aided by the members of his consortium, Fabius starts the process. Fleshy cables from the ship were inserted into the power couplings that linked Elion to his doom siren. The siren's own power cables were spliced into the access panels of the core. His legs and spine were braced, and mag clamped into place. The operation was a variation of one he had conducted a long time ago, involving a reluctant navigator and a void-hardened biosarcophagus. Wiring a living organism into a vessel's existing network was not unheard of, but it was difficult to do correctly. They operated with haste, placing the neural webbing Fabius had grown from the samples cultivated from the Psyche and Eldar prisoner onto the cortex of Alion's malformed brain. The noise marine's warped physiology ensured that no rejection occurred. At Fabius' instruction, a lion began to interface with the ship, and sparks crackled along its quivering flesh as the rerouted system stabilised. Fabius and his consortium had performed similar operations on the other vessels in the fleet, using psychers provided by the Radiant King, and they were now the central hub of a network of mines. Summoned to the command deck alongside those warband leaders that the Radiant deemed worthy enough to join the attack, he would reveal that they were well on their way to their target, in fact less than two days travel to the coordinates Fabius had provided. Kasparos revealed his strategy, the main thrust and initial wave of boarding parties forming a trident formation. The outer prongs would establish secure beachhead forward and aft, while the center would deliver a teleport homer into the very heart of the craft world. The trident would be the open blade, designed to draw the eye, to pull the enemy in. Once the craft world's defenders had been drawn into the central tine of the trident, the teleport homer would be activated, and the hidden blade revealed. He would lead the teleporting force and make a suitably impressive entrance. Fabius would lead his own mission as agreed, with Savanta second in the Joybound accompanying him alongside the World Eater Arian and the World Bearer Demonologist Sakara. Their target was a particular docking tower sufficiently isolated and close to their goal. The approach plan would be successful and the defences of Luganath would only stir when Alain succumbed to the Song of Slanesh and disintegrated. The Craftworld's defences activated, though sluggishly due to the lingering effects of the psychic miasma. The Butcher Bird, with Bile's group including Ignori's Gland Hounds and Savanta's Renegade Astartes, dived through the firestorm that ensued using the cruiser as cover. The gunship's assault cannons tore an entrance into the docking platform. The boarding party easily dispatched the first group of Eldar that attempt to halt their progress deeper into the Craftworld and using the still-living body of one, Sakara is able to open a portal into the warp through which demonettes, some riding fiends of Slanesh, manifest, led by a Keeper of Secrets even more ancient than Kanathara. Leaving the demons to rampage ahead, and Ignori's gland hounds to hold the docking bay, the rest of the boarding party would push on. The Radiant strategy progressed as planned, but the Eldar were reacting more quickly than they'd estimated. Despite the increasing resistance of the Xenos, the Teleport Homo was successfully deployed, motes of light beginning to dance across the plaza where the battle raged. Indistinct shapes wavered and solidified as a tall, elegant figure stalked through the fading light of the teleportation flare, 
accompanied by a monstrous army. The Radiant King, in his joyful repose, had arrived. Fabius would push on towards his separate goal using the chaos of the Neverborn and the destruction wrought by the other boarding parties to cover their progress towards the Dome of the Crystal Seers. Smashing aside the great curved doors, Fabius was at last able to cast his eyes on his prize. The vitrified bodies of alien seers rose from the soil, stretching up and out into mighty trees of crystal, whose canopies framed the stars above. Some trace of the beings they once were, though, still remained, just enough to whisper their origins. Fabius would advance with torment raised towards the nearest tree, ready to smash it to flinders and gather the pieces, the answer to his problem within touching distance. But before the blow could fall, a sudden wash of white-hot flame would drive them back. Curses and cries of alarm rose as more flame shot up on all sides, herding them back as a peal of laughter echoed through the chamber. Taunting Fabius through the flames and the crystalline vegetation was Salandri Vale Walker, shadow seer of the harlequins they battled on Sublime. Chromatic phantoms burst from the trees and raced into battle, tumbling and leaping like a flood of shimmering water. She engaged Fabius personally, his targeting array couldn't keep up with her rapid movement, rendering his needler useless and his stim-enhanced reflexes were barely adequate to meet and counter the blows from her staff. The Harlequin showed Fabius many possible fates, a hundred thousand paths each leading to a different future, but all of them had one thing in common. If he took up the regalia of command, his survival was assured, but if he held fast to his course, he would perish. By the hands of his foes, that of his creations, or even his own, Death was a certainty. By sheer force of will, the spell was broken, and Bile would slam his scepter down hard enough to crack the wraithbone floor of the grove. A red glow blazed from the eye sockets of the scepter, banishing the shadows and scattering fragments. All around him, the trees screamed. The shadow seer froze as a voice echoed through the grove. The screams of the trees rose in pitch as something monstrous shattered one with a blow from an obsidian blade. The Keeper of Secrets stalked out of the gloom, crunching crystal shards beneath its hooves. The Harlequins were forced to retreat, leaving Fabius to gather what he had come from. In the main assault, the Radiant King reveled in consuming the spirit stones of the Eldar that clustered about him like stinging gnats seeking his death. But he was far beyond death now and beyond life. The joints of his armour creaked, as the flesh within swelled and thickened. He had grown too large to be contained by such frail artifice. His muscles tore, and the Radiant threw back his head and howled for joy. The transformation had begun. His body expanded, swelling from a foul corona of light. Ceramite buckled and split as the body within became at once both more and less than mortal flesh. He screamed in pleasure, as all that was within him boiled away to feed the fires of his apotheosis. But at the moment of his ascension, the purpose of the Eldar tactics became clear. They had split the Radiant's forces and opened a path right to him. They'd drawn the Emperor's children in with the promise of easy meat, and then formed a killing corridor to hold back any who didn't take the bait. And now the final thrust slid home, in a riot of colour and crackling sorcery. The Harlequin troop cavorted forwards in streams of light. The troopmaster led them, gesticulating grandly and cutting obscure symbols in the air with his sword. And amid the riot of colour, and noise came the orange-robed witches of Luganath, a conclave of Eldar warlocks, their silent dignity at odds with the clowns who escorted them to their prey. The troopmaster strutted towards the Radiant and bowed deeply to the convulsing figure addressing him, but before Kasparov could speak, the troop surged forward to attack with breathtaking synchronicity. With limbs that no longer functioned as you remembered, and a body in a state of flux, the Radiant sought to defend himself, 
but with his metamorphosis incomplete, the Harlequin spun about him deftly, leaping over his clumsy blows and slicing chunks from his quivering flesh. The Eldar Psychers formed a circle around the duel, sweeping their blades and spears in graceful arcs, etching strange, corrosing patterns in the thickening air. The Radiant's mutated form began to steam, motes of light whirled beneath his elastic flesh and his screams changed to those of fear. The Harlequins disengaged, leaving the Radiant alone in his circle. The Warlocks raised their weapons as one, and simultaneously thrust them into the Radiant. He screamed once more, and as he did so, his body finally began to come apart. Pinned by the Xenos blades, the essence of him rose as if drawn towards the cold light of the distant stars. Twisted bones splintered, caught by a sorcerous wind as demonic flesh turned to smoke, and then, with a crack of displaced air, the Radiant King, in his joyful repose, was gone. Making their own escape, Fabius had heard the resonating scream of the Radiant as he met his fate. The chief apothecary had been at Idris for the ascension of Fulgrim. He knew the sound of apotheosis well, and that had not been it. Fabius ordered them to follow the building war song of the Cacophony, and reunite with the main assault group in the central beach point. Savona would briefly challenge his authority to command the forces of the slain Radiant King, but Fabius would use his rank, bestowed by Fulgrim himself as Lieutenant Commander of the Emperor's Children, to quell any dissension. As the din rose, the very walls of the craft world trembled and cracked as they approached the plaza being held by the main assault force. Assailed by Xenos aspect warriors and wraith bone constructs, only the intervention of Zeminsky's battle automata prevented them being isolated and cut down. The scream of the noise marines rose to an impossibly high crescendo, too high even for the enhanced senses of the space marines to discern, but the craft world could. As the piercing sound spiralled up into inaudibility, the tremors increased in intensity, causing the ground to heave and wraithbone to peel away. The plaza had become the epicentre of the great reverberation which rippled outwards, the great dome above cracked, venting atmosphere as the towers around them exploded in cascades of rubble, burying heretic Astartes and Eldar alike. Before they could make their retreat to the boarding craft once again, the Harlequins entered the fray. In an attempt to save Olander from the troop master, Zemiskis fell, but the Eldar also paid with his life. The Shadow Seer again presented herself to Fabius, but it was Olander who confronted her. She explained his role in their performance, that of Count Sunflame, whose death galvanizes the King of Feathers to take his rightful place on the throne. Finally, the truth was revealed, the pact between Olander and the capricious clowns. They had foreseen the possibility of this attack long ago. With the Radiant King gone before reaching the height of his powers, the threat to the Eldar was diminished and Orlando would see Fabius take up control of his forces and heal the wounds of the broken Third Legion. Canticle City didn't have to be his epitaph if only he would take up the burden of leadership of the Legion. That, the Clone Lord says, is the Harlequin's true goal, to divert him from his vision for the future of humanity and saddle him with the responsibility of leadership in its place. All trace of humour left the Harlequin's words as Fabius committed the grievous sin of going off script, refusing his allotted role in their performance. Taking advantage of their momentary imbalance, Fabius and the remaining warriors were able to reach the Dreadclaw gunships that will be their method of extraction, but Oleander would not join them. Spared execution only due to his past services, he is left to fend for himself as the gunships depart. The withdrawal from Luganath was a nightmare of screaming engines and shuddering decks. Many in the assault force ignored the order to retreat and died. Barely a hundred space marines in all made it back to the ship, including a number of eerily silent noise marines. The exertions aboard the Luganath had taken a great toll on Fabius's tumor-laced body, but he was still strong enough to be able to gather the strength to offer Savona and the other Joybound present a simple choice. Serve or die. 
Under increasing fire from the guns of the craft world, Fabius ordered the Qua Hazat to rendezvous with the Vesilius that had been hidden at the fringes of the system. As the engines of the Lunar-class cruiser began to move them away from the Luganath, Fabius retired to the former private quarters of the Radiant King. Sagging into the fleshy throne, he allowed himself a moment of stillness. His body was failing once again, beyond even his skills to repair. He would need another, and most likely more in the future, a parasite in his own flesh. He must persist. He could not rest. He must go on until his work is done. Thank you for joining me on our journey towards the dawn of new man, and I hope I've earned your subscription today. And I'll see you again in the near future, where there is only war.